Hello everyone. So in this video, we are going to solve the physics paper 2, January 2020. Let's start. Question number 1. This question is about energy resources. The table lists some methods of generating electricity using energy resources. Place sticks in the table to show if energy method, if each method uses our renewable energy resources, one has been done for you. So, at first we need to know what are actually renewable resources, energy resources. Renewable energy resources are the uh, sources that can be that can never be limited that can uh, that we can use for a long period of time and that won't ever run out for example wind sunlight uh, water these are the resources by which we can generate electricity and the resources will never run out so these are non renewable resources resources that never run out And the other resources would be non-renewable energy resources, for example, nuclear, fossil fuels. We can also produce electricity using non-renewable energy resources, but the problem is that they will eventually run out. They are limited resources, so it's not a... Uh, it's not that much ethical to use non-renewable resources. And in this question A, we just need to pick out the re energy resources from this list that are only renewable energy resources. At first, coal power station. Coal power station, coal comes comes from fossil fuel, and we already say that fossil fuel is a uh, is a form of non-renewable resources. So we cannot place a tick uh, beside coal power stations. Diesel generators, diesel also comes from fossils, so not a tick for this one too. Geothermal power station. Geothermal power station means that we are actually using the earth's heat that is uh, that came from the core of the uh, core of the earth, and to produce and we use that heat to produce electricity. And this is a not uh, sorry, this is a renewable resources because. Geothermal power stations, as we, it uses the heat produced by the earth, the heat will never run out. So, this is a renewable resources. Hydroelectric power station. Hydroelectric power station uses water and water is a renewable energy resource. So, another tick. Natural gas turbine. Natural gas also comes from fossils. So, it is a non-renewable resources. Nuclear power station. Nuclear power station uses nuclear atoms, so nuclear things, so it is also a non-renewable resource. Solar cell is also already done. And wind turbine. Wind is also a renewable energy resource, so a tick for this one too. Part A is done. Moving to part B. Solar cells can be used to generate electricity. Part 1. How is energy transformed from the sun to a solar cell? How uh, it means that how the sun actually transfers its energy to the solar cells, obviously by radiation, because we cannot see the sun rays. So it is radiation by radiation. State one advantage of using one disadvantage of using solar cells to generate electricity. Uh, there could be many disadvantages, like the solar panels. For uh, the solar panels need a big amount of space on land and we could have used that space for our crop production that would actually increase our food supply. But now we are using that space for electricity so it actually eats up a lot of space and it also kind of depends on the amount of sunshine uh, sun shines a day. Like if it's a rainy day, then the electricity output would be really uh, small amount. And if it's a sunny day, then the electricity output would be a bigger amount. So the electricity produ produced by solar cells totally depends on the uh, time sun shines for each day. The other reasons can be... It also causes a visual pollution like it doesn't look pretty when you see at a ground and it's all full of solar panels even uh, like compare the two grounds together one containing crop fi uh, crop fields or grasses every everything green and na natural and another field containing all these solar panels obviously we will not uh, prefer the solar panel containing graph because it would look 
uglier so not do not use the word uglier but it would look messy on that side so it causes a visual pollution so as the question has only one mark we just need to write one point out of the three conditions that are given in the mark scheme so i'm gonna use that the solar panels or solar cells will only generate electricity when it is sunny solar cells only generate electricity when it is sunny this is the end of question number one moving to question number two the photograph shows a brass mass part a state the formula linking linking density mass and volume we all know this its density is equals to mass by volume the brass mass has a mass of 454 grams the density of brass is 8.46 gram per centimeter cube calculate the volume of the brass mass give the unit so we just need to rearrange the equation and make volume the subject that would be volume is equals to mass by density and now put in the values in it that is a 454 divided by 8.46 and you get a value for 53.7 centimeter cube I am intentionally leaving my value for volume into three significant figures because all the information given in these questions were also given in three significant figures even though the question didn't ask me to uh, arrange my answer or answer my questions in three significant figures i'm still gonna put the value of volume to three significant figures and write the answer over here in the space given 53.7 and the unit is centimeter cube Question number three, curling is a sport played on ice. A player slides stone A across the ice towards a, sto a scoring zone. The ice reduces friction so that there is negligible friction when the stone is sliding. Part A, stone, lifts, uh, stone A lifts the player's hand with a velocity of 2.9 meter per second and the mass of stone A is 17 kg. See the formula linking momentum, mass and velocity. So the equation for momentum was momentum is equals to mass into velocity part 2 state uh, show that the momentum of stone is approximately 50 kg meter per second. So it says approximately so we, our answer do not have to be exactly 50. So let's solve it. momentum is equals to mass into velocity the mass of the stone a was 17 and the velocity of stone a was 2.9 if you multiply this the product is 49.3 meter point three meter per second but i'm obviously gonna leave my answer to two significant figures again because of the same reason all the information given in the question were itself in two significant figures so that's why i'm leaving my answer to three significant two significant figures and as it says approximately 50 kg meter per second so we do not need to write 50 in our answer we cannot write the real answer that we got that is 49 meter per second sorry 49 kg meter per second the unit was wrong 49 kg meter per second end of question number three part a moving to the next page part b stone a slides towards the scoring zone in the scoring zone stone a collides with a stationary stone b stationary means that stone b was at rest it was not moving so it means at rest Part 1. 
After the collision, both stones move in the same direction as their initial direction of stone A. The velocity of stone A after the collision is 0.4 meter per second. Calculate the velocity of stone B after the collision. Mass of stone B is 19 kg. So let's draw a diagram of how the thing went before and after collision. Like before collision. Stone A was moving in this direction and stone B was stationary. As stone A was moving, it has its mass and velocity. Velocity was 2.9 and as stone B was stationary, it didn't have any velocity. So velocity was 0 over here. After collision, what happened? After collision, they both start moving in the same direction. But it didn't say that they both start moving in the same direction together. They said that they both start moving in the same direction. That means they both start moving in the same direction separately. Separated from each other. So now this is stone A and this is stone B. And now they are both moving in the same direction. Velocity of V of uh, stone A after collision is 0 0.44 meter per second and the velocity of b after collision is not given we need to find that so i am using this before collision momentum before collision is equals to momen momentum after collision momentum before collision was the momentum of stone A and the momentum of stone B that would be 17 into 2.9 plus 19 into 0 and after collision the momentum would be the momentum of stone A plus momentum of stone B that is 17 into 0 0.4 plus 19 into V. I am using V for the velocity of stone B after collision. So if we make nine a V the subject, it would be 17 multiply 2.9 minus 17 multiply 0 0.4 divided by 19 and you will get a value of 2.23 meter per second. So this is the value of speed after the collision. This is the value of speed of stone B after the collision. 2.23. Part 2. When the stone collided, they were in contact for a time of 25 milliseconds. Calculate the magnitude of force stone A exerted on stone B in this collision. So we need to find the momentum uh, or sorry, the force that stone A exerted on stone B. We know always that whenever two bodies are colliding, they actually give force to each other, give, uh, exert force on each other. Like A would exert a force on B and B would actually also give it an uh, exert a force on A, exert a force on A. And then... And it would exert this force for a particular time. The part time is given that is 25 milliseconds. We need to convert the 25 milliseconds into seconds. We know that 1 second is equals to 1000 milliseconds. So 25 millisecond, millisecond is actually 0 0.025 seconds. So... Actually, we are uh, uh, this is actually a mass of impulse. So, we are finding the magnitude of force. Of force on stone B. Magnitude of force on stone B would be the change in momentum of stone A divided by the time it they were together in the collision. The change in momentum of stone A would be the first momentum we got on the other page that was 50 and this, this momentum after collision, this momentum of stone A after collision. So we need to subtract this 
divided by time was 0 0.025 momentum after collision for stone a was 6.8 and momentum before collision for stone a was 50 so we are subtracting momentum after collision from momentum before collision of stone a and if you do the calculations for this you will get a value of approximately 1700 newtons and this is the value that is the force exerted on stone A on stone B by stone A so we need to write the answer over here 1700 newtons I hope question number three was clear question number four actually there is a problem in question number three like if we are using the value for momentum of stone B before collision the value actual value would be 1728 so this would be 1728 the force exerted on stone b by stone a is 1728 newtons the end of question number three moving to question number four a student uses this apparatus to demonstrate the effect of electric charge he pours some fine powder into a funnel the fine powder moves through a length of plastic tubing and falls into a metal can the metal can rests on a metal cap the metal cap is connected to a thin piece of metal via a metal rod when the powder lands on the can the thin piece of metal moves away from the metal rod explain why the thin piece of metal moves away from the metal rod so we need to find the answer that why this metal thin piece of metal is moving away from the rod we can see that an uncharged particle powder so at this point the powders are uncharged uncharged powders are in the funnel and they are flowing into the canal through this plastic tubing while they are flowing there will obviously a friction there will obviously be a friction between the powder powder molecule powder particles and the surface of the plastic tubing and due to this friction the powders get charged negatively charged mostly so here friction occurs friction between the powders and the surface of the plastic tubing and due to this friction the powders that actually fall onto the metal can are not anymore uncharged they are charged now charged and when these charged particles fall onto the metal can we can see that everything down from metal can is made up of metal so as we all know metals are good conductors so they easily conduct they easily get all these negative charges from the negatively charged powder particles and this makes the rod and the thin piece of metal both of them same charges so now as the negative charges has fall onto the metal can and as all of the things are metals themselves so they get the negative charges so now both of this are of negative are of same charge let's not mention negative charge let's say it's same charge and as they are both of have both having the same charge we all know same charges ripple so that's why the thin piece of metal is moving away from the metal rod showing that both of them has the same charges this is the reason and now we need to write the answer it's it contains a four mark so we have to put four points in our answer at least it's safe to include five points because some of the points might not be a part of the mark, mark scheme. So always try to include another extra point. Do not always go for, okay, there are four marks, so I'm going to write four exact points. So let's start. As the powder move along the plastic tubing. It becomes charged due to friction due to friction we know metals are good conductors conductors so the charge is passed to the metal rod
rod and the thin piece of metal giving both the same charge so we know uh, giving both the same charge we know that similar charges or same charge ripple that's why the thin piece of metal is moving away so this is the answer of question number four part a moving to part b A coulomb meter measures electric charge. The student connects a coulomb meter to the metal can when all the powder has landed. In the can, the coulomb meter shows a reading of negative 9.4 into 10 to the power negative 9 coulomb. What statement is true for the can? So we all know that uh, due to friction, the particle usually gets negative charges. And whenever anything shows current it means there is a flow of negative charges whenever anything shows that it has or it possesses current it means that negative charges are flowing around its surface or through it that means that the particle or the object now has negative or now has gained negative charges so there are four options it gains negatively charged electrons loses negatively charged electrons gains positively charged electrons and gain or loses positively charged electron we know whenever uh, in order to in order for an object to possess current or get uh, current it needs to have needs to have negative it needs to have a flow or gain of negative charged electrons or ob negative charged electrons so that in that for that theory we are going to choose option a because only in option A, it says that the object gains negative, uh, ele negatively charged electrons. Part 2. State the formula linking charge, current and time. So the formula for charge, current and time is charge is equals to current into time. The charge is given and it takes a time of 12 seconds from the powder start uh, when the powder starts landing on the metal can until all the powder has landed in the can calculate the mean cha charging current so we need to find the mean chain uh, charging current that means we need to find the current and in order to do that we make we have to make current the subject that would be and then the equation would be current is equals to charge divided by time charge was negative 9.4 into 10 to the power um, ne negative 9 divided by 12 seconds and the answer you get is 7.83 into 10 to the power negative 10 and again I'm gonna put my answer or keep my answer in two decimal places or sorry two significant figures because all the information given in the question are itself in two significant figures like 12 and 9.4 these are all in two significant figures and that's why i'm keeping my answer also 7.8 that is two significant figures so this is the end of part b moving to part c the student suggests that this demonstration is similar to refu refueling an aircraft. The powder represents the fuel and the metal can and the metal can represents the fuel tank in the aircraft. Explain how the student should modify this apparatus to demonstrate how to minimize the uh, dangers when refueling an aircraft. You may add to the diagram to help your answer. Okay, so uh, it says that this is the exact method that happens when, when we are refueling an aircraft. Uh, because the situation is still the same, right? Uh, you, we use a pipe that connects the aircraft with the fuel 
fuel reservoir and then the fuel reservoir and the fuel from the fuel reservoir flows into the aircraft through the pipe and while it is flowing there is obviously friction between the pipe and the fuel and that would make the fuel a charged particle and while the charged particle is entering the aircraft there might be a build up of negatively charged particles and we all know due to build up of negatively charged particles there might be an explosion so in order to improve our situations prevent that explosion we obviously should produce our path where resistance is least so we can obviously use the earth wire because earth wire provides a path that has the least resistance and as it has the least resistance even though the fuels would still be going into the negatively charged fuels would still be going into the aircraft the charges won't build up why because the charges will take the easier way take the way with less resistance that is the earth wire and they will escape from the aircraft through the earth wire to the ground and thus it will prevent explosions and further harmful things further disasters so let's write the answer due to build up of charge the aircraft might explode to prevent that we need to connect an earth wire to the aircraft during refueling earth wire provides a low resistance path so charge flow to the ground so charge flow to the ground and there will be no build up of charge on aircraft and we can also add the diagram of earth wire so that would be this you can it, it's optional you can draw it or not it totally depends on you so that is the end of question number four moving to question number five a sonometer is a piece of wire is a piece of equipment used to investigate the frequency of waves on a string the photographer shows a sonometer the string is under tension when the string is plugged it vibrates to produce a sound wave describe how an oscilloscope should be used to measure the frequency of the sound wave from the sonometer okay so it says how can we use the sonometer so the sorry the oscilloscope to measure the frequency of the sonometer that's just the instructions for using the oscilloscope so we're just gonna there's nothing to explain to be honest i'm just gonna write the answer in here Let's write the student need to connect the oscilloscope with microphone and adjust and adjust time base and and adjust to gate and adjust that 
to get a constant trace and also the time base we need to also adjust the time base and then the student need to measure the number of uh, square for each complete waves so she needs to measure the number of square for each complete waves and multiplied it with the time base to get time period this would give us the value of time period and then obviously using the equation f is equals to 1 by t we can find the frequency so this is the end of question number 5a i hope this was clear moving to question number b1 a student investigates how the frequency of sound from the sonometer varies with the length of the string. This is the student's method. Apply a constant tension force to the string, plunk the string and measure the frequency of the sound wave produced. Move the bridge to change the length of the string, plunk the string and measure the new frequencies of the sound wave produced. Repeat the method for different lengths of string. Give a control variable for the student's investigation. So, control variable means that one variable that we controlled or make that uh, variable constant for the entire investigation. A variable that was constant for the entire investigation. So, constant variable for our investigation. Constant variable. We can see that the question itself says constant tension force. So, that's one of the variables that was kept constant in this experiment the other very options would be diameter of the wire we didn't change the diameter of the wire we're just changing the length so the diameter is constant the these are the two options but as the question says one so we are just gonna write one option only that would be the force was constant the force was the force is the var comes, uh, control variable. Variable. The table shows the student's results. Calculate the mean frequency for a string of length 60 centimeters. So the string of length 60 centimeters as test 1, 2 and 3. So we need to find the mean that would be 36 plus 32 plus 35 divided by 3 and we will get a value of 34 hertz. So we are going to write 3, 4 hertz over here and in this space given. Part B3 is done, B2 is done, part B3 and 4. Plot a graph using the results and obviously draw a curve of best fit. Now I am going to use these two tables only. And out of these two tables, which one would be on the x-axis and which one would be on the y-axis, it depends actually on the variable. Like mean length of the uh, frequency, mean, mean of the frequency, it's kind of a dependent variable. And we all know dependent variables always lie on the y-axis. So this is a y-axis variable. Why? Because it's a dependent variable. Because the frequency actually depends on the length of the wire. As the frequency increases, the length decreases. The, sorry, as the length of the string increases, the frequency decreases. So frequency is a dependent variable. Whereas the length, this criteria is actually not, does not depend on anything. It's like time. It's an independent factor. It doesn't depend on frequency or anything. So this thing 
this chart this column actually indicates independent va variable as it indicates independent variable so it will be on the x-axis I already plotted the graph for this chart on the next page so this is the chart I obviously mentioned the axis name axis I have uh, labeled the axis these are the two axes labeled with the values also labeled and I have drawn a graph of best feet and that's how the entire graph looks like that's the end of part B three and four the graph is here there's nothing more I can explain in the graph moving to part five determine the string length needed to produce sound wave of frequency 75 Hertz so we need to find the sound wave of uh, a length of string needed to produce a frequency of 75 Hertz so what will I do I will go to the frequency at uh, on the y-axis where it is showing the frequency numbers and I will choose the 75 column and at this point I'm gonna start going to the graph that at what point the graph was graph had this 75 frequency and then going downward would give me the value for the length we can see that it is between 40 and 20 that is basically 30 so the string length required to produce a 70 a sound wave of frequency 75 Hertz is 30 centimeters we need to obviously show that in the graph that we did the working by using the dotted lines so that's why I'm showing this the dotted lines in the graph and write the answer in the space given that is 30 centimeters moving to part 6 the student cannot hear the sound from the sonometer for the uh, for some of the spring lengths tested explain why the spring uh, string lengths produce sounds that humans cannot hear let's look at the graph the chart first here the chart says that when the string length was 20 centimeter the frequency was 106 when it was 40 centimeter it was 53 and it gradually decreases but for this two for this two lengths the frequency are just too small why am i saying too small because they are less than less than 20 hertz and we all know that less than 20 hertz means they are or uh, they are outside the audible range outside the audible range means infrasound and we cannot hear infrasound because the human audible range is up to 20 is from 20 to 20,000 kilo uh, 20,000 hertz and as the frequency produced for the lengths 120 and 140 is below 20 it means they are infrasound both of them are infrasounds and infrasounds are out of our audible range and that's why we cannot hear the student cannot hear the sound produced for these two lengths the answer is written over here the student will not hear the sound produced for both 120 centimeter and 140 centimeters because they did produce sounds of frequency 18 and 15 that is below the infra that is below the audible range so, so the reason is because humans cannot uh, hear sound with frequency lower than 20 hertz this is the answer of part f 6 and that is the end of question number 5 moving to question number 6 this question is about stars astronomers measure the absolute magnitude of stars state what is meant by the term absolute magnitude we all know that absolute magnitude means it is a measurement a calculation uh, to measure the brightness to measure how bright a star is so like the answer would be a measurement of the brightness of a star it is a measurement of the brightness of a star Part B, the evolution of stars can be drawn on a hertzsprung russell diagram, HR diagram. The complete, uh, complete the HR diagram by labeling the x-axis, completing the absolute magnitude scale, drawing the main sequence, red giant and white dwarf regions. So the region is already drawn here and obviously the x-axis would be the color and this is the graph, the main sequence flowing between the graph the red regions on the upper part and the white drafts on the lower part make sure that they are all actually labeled from the like 
the x axis are actually on the same a region don't skip that so this is the graph you can actually find a better version of the graph in the book i just you need to just memorize the graph like how the patterns are nothing else so that is the end of question number six two and moving to question number seven the photograph shows a glass plate made from the uranium glass uranium oxide is used to give the glass a green color uranium 238 is the most common isotope of uranium and can be represented using this symbol state what uranium what information the uranium 92 the numbers 92 and 238 give about the nucleus of this isotope of uranium we all know this top number represents the mass number and the bottom number represents the atomic number and atomic number is basically the number of protons it shows that how many protons the does the atom contain number of protons and this shows the number of protons and neutrons the number of nucleons the atom contains So this is also the answer of the question. The question said that uh, what 92 and 238 indicates. We need to say 92 indicates the number of protons and 238 indicates number of nucleons. So this is question number part, uh, question number 7, part A done, part A1, part a2 is uranium-235 decays by alpha emission. Alpha emission. Describe how the nucleus of a uranium-235 atom changes as a result of alpha emission. Alpha emission means that it would release an alpha particle. Release alpha particles. And how? what would be the result uh, uh, after when uh, uranium-238 releases an alpha particle? Alpha particle is basically, it has... Two protons, two neutrons. Then it would it, its mass number would be four, and atomic number would be two. And if we subtract two thirty eight and ninety two, as uranium will release alpha particles, so that's why we are subtracting, and we will get a uranium containing two thirty four and ninety. So we can see that it lost two. Two protons and two neutrons. So the answer of this question is alpha has two protons and two neutrons. So after the emission, the nucleus of uranium 238 will lose two protons and two neutrons this is the answer you don't need to write this in your diag in your answer paper and that's the end of question number part uh, question number seven part a moving to the next page Part B, the table gives some information about the uranium glass plate, mass of plate, percentage of plate of uranium-238 by mass, mass of uranium-238 atom. Calculate the number of atoms, uh, uranium-238 atoms in the plate. So at first we need to find the um, total mass of the uranium inside that plate. So mass of uranium 238 in that plate that is 1.1 into 4.5 by 100 and the mass is 0 0.0495 kg this last column gives you the mass of one atom of uranium 235 so we can say if we can say that zero 4.0 into 10 to the power negative 27 kg gives you a mass of one atom one atom so the mass of so the number of atoms 0 0.0495 kgs will be 
zero point zero four nine five divided by four point zero ten to the power negative twenty seven and the value is one point two into ten to the power twenty five atoms. So the table contain one point two into ten to the power twenty five uranium atoms. Write this on the space given. So this is the answer of part one. I just used the unitary method at the end. I hope the calculation was clear enough for you for you all to understand. Moving to B2. Uranium-235 is an alpha emitter and has a half-life of 4.5 billion years. Explain why it is safe to eat food from the uranium uh, glass plate. First of all, alpha is actually not harmful for us. Why? Because it's not a bacteria, it's not a virus, so it cannot contaminate the food. So as long as it's not contaminating the food, it's not harmful for us. The other reason is alpha has very less penetrating ability and it, yeah it has a high ionizing ability but that too its ionizing, ionizing ability is not that much strong to reach the body and harm us so the even though it has high ionizing ability and low penetrating ability it won't harm us because the range is really short the range of ionizing ability for alpha emitter for alpha is really small so it cannot actually reach our body and harm us it gets used up or totally gets to zero before reaching to our body and the other point is that as it has a half-life of 4.5 billion years that means a huge amount of half-life it has a half-life is uh, that is very long so whenever a particle contains a half-life that is very long it means that its activity will be very slow it, de it decays really slowly and that's why its half-life is really long and as long as any particle that has a half-life with this two mount this 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 big that is 4.5 billion years it obviously cannot harm us because in order to harm us it needs to act uh, it need to decay fast it need, its activity need to be fast but as it has a small half-life so its activity is low and thus it cannot harm us and it is okay and ethical to you not ethical to use in our foods the answer would be it does not contaminate food and alpha has a short short range and alpha has a short range and also less penetrating ability So, uh, penetrating ability, so it cannot harm and it would end up before reaching our body. So, penetrating ability to reach our body. Also, as it has long half-life, This means activity will be very small. Small, not use the word small, use it better low. Activity will be very low. And this is the end of question number 7. Moving to the last question of the paper. This question is about magnetic fields. The diagram shows a positively charged proton moving downward in the uniform magnetic field. Force is towards the left and velocity is downward. So obviously the paper will the sorry the proton will force will feel a force into the page. So that is part A. Force into the page. Moving to the next part. Uh, we have to draw the magnetic fields around this coil and we all know the magnetic fields would be going out of the coil. So we need to write the, we need to draw the magnetic fields for both ends of the coil and at least two complete circular coils. We did 
complete two circular coins at the both end and connected uh, and did few other coils in the middle section so this is the end uh, showing that uh, magnetic field is going outside the coil and the directions are shown it has three marks that means you need to at least draw three lines at least draw three lines but it's better to draw more lines because it doesn't cost you much time moving to the last part of the question a wireless charger a wireless charging base uses a magnetic field to charge the battery of a mobile phone there is an amplitude alternating current in a coil of wire in the alternating ba in the charging base there is another coil of wire connected to the battery in the mobile phone explain how the wireless charging base changes the battery of charges the battery of the mobile phone so how does basically the wireless chargers work so at first when the charger is plugged in the coil inside the wireless charger gets the electricity and due to this electricity it produces a alternating magnetic field so this charger produces an alternating magnetic field and when we put our phone on top of the charger that the phone also contain a charging a charging coil like it, it was also mentioned this here that the, another coil was inside the phone so this coil now actually pen uh, actually cuts the magnetic field of the charger perpendicularly and whenever the two fields cut the uh, cut each other perpendicularly a voltage is induced and due to this induced voltage the battery inside the phone gets the electricity and thus it gets charged so the answer would be as current starts flowing into the wireless charger it produces alternating magnetic fields in the charge uh, in the uh, co uh, coil in the coil inside the charger the coil in phone cuts the magnetic field perpendicularly thus a voltage is induced therefore due to this voltage the battery the battery gets current from the coil in phone part c1 is done i hope it was clear moving to part c2 describe the advantages and disadvantages of using a high a high current in the wireless charging base so the answer is two and we just need to then we just need to give two point one point for each criteria that is one advantage and one disadvantage so we all know that if a object gets high current that means that the magnetic fields will be more stronger now and if magnetic fields are stronger there will be more uh, more things can cut it perpendicularly and uh, therefore more voltage is induced and more voltage means more current and faster charging so a high current means stronger magnetic fields and stronger magnetic fields means that the battery will charge fast 
fast. Thus, the battery will charge fast, but due to but we all know that whenever we charge anything, sorry, whenever we're using high current, there is obviously a buildup of charge and uh, the current will be or flowing for a longer time and that means they, they will produce heat. And thus, using a high current, we will make the charger go hot more quickly. So the disadvantage would be this, that the charger will get more hot. But due to high current, the charger will get more hot so this is the end of question number eight and also it ends the question uh, paper january 2020 i hope it was clear enough if you have any questions you can comment it in the comment section thank you for watching